Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Shoham Day and I'm a research scientist at DeepMind. And I'm really excited uh, to be talking here today on our recent work on normalizer-free networks. Um, so here's sort of like a, uh, just to flash up the main result right at the beginning. Uh, so what are normalizer-free networks? It's a new family of resonance. Um, and the key property of, of this uh, new family of resonance is that it is completely normalizer-free. And in particular, it has no batch normalization layers. Um, and uh, so just to show the main result that I'm gonna be building up towards uh, in this talk, if you see the plot on the right here, um, so here I'm plotting image classification uh, results on ImageNet uh, top one accuracies with our uh, NFNet family of models. So, um, so on the y-axis, we have the top one accuracies and on the x-axis, we have training latency, which is sort of like the time taken to take a training step um, on a TPU with a batch size of 32 per, per device. And here we're sort of comparing NFNets, which are the red curve with um, a bunch of other prior state-of-the-art models on, um, on ImageNet. And if you sort of uh, compare, compare these models, you see that NFNet significantly improves um, performance, both in terms of uh, test accuracy, as well as in uh, training time. And in particular, if you sort of compare the NFNet F1 model with the efficient B7 model, we see that it's, it's up to like 8.7 times faster to train than an efficient at B7 up to the same validation accuracy. And our biggest models uh, get a top one uh, accuracy of 86.5 without extra data, which sets a new state of the art. Um, and all of our code is uh, available in JAX. So this was actually quite a long project, um, which sort of resulted in a series of three papers. And I'm gonna sort of briefly talk about each of these sort of the key results in uh, each of these three papers, which uh, led us to uh, get getting to NFNets. And so the first paper, uh, batch normalization biases uh, residual blocks towards the identity function was joint work with Sam Smith and it was at NeurIPS last year. And then sort of Andy joined this project and uh, led the last two papers. Uh, so the second paper characterizing signal propagation to close the performance gap um, in unnormalized resonance, this, was, uh, this is going to be in iClear this year. And we just put up the final paper up on archive recently. And so let's get started. And before I sort of begin, uh, feel free to sort of interrupt me with any questions uh, during the talk as well as after, obviously. Okay, so uh, here's a sort of like a screen capture I took from the Papers with Code website, which tracks the ImageNet top one accuracies um, attained by different models over time. And so if you look at this, uh, so this is image classification results on ImageNet. And if you sort of like look at when, when batch normalization and resonance were uh, proposed, batch normalization, the batch norm paper came out around 2015, and the ResNet paper, residual network paper, came out around 2016. And these two kinds of techniques have been extremely popular in the literature, uh, particularly for getting good results on vision models. And this can be seen if you look at this, like the citation counts of these two papers. And like sort of an important thing to note here is that uh, important observation is that almost all like state of the art networks since 2016 have used both the combination of skip connections as well as batch normalization. And so we sort of started this project by asking ourselves, why has this combination been so dominant? And it's really like one of the key insights in this like sort of series of work is that, you know, studying the combination of batch normal resonance together uh, is really important to understand the benefits of batch normalization. And this is in contrast with some prior work which looks at batch normalization in isolation, which leads them to sort of not, uh, not um, identify all of the benefits of batch normalization. So just to sort of like set the scene of what I mean by batch normalization and resonance, so here on the right, I show a simple residual block um, in, in, a, in a residual network, where uh, the key thing is that we add the skip path 
which is like an identity skip connection, which bypasses all the linear and nonlinear operations on the residual part. And at the end of the block, you sort of sum the, uh, the signal from the skip path and the residual path together. Um, and uh, then you sort of stack a bunch of these residual blocks together to build a residual network. And a batch normalization layer, what it does is it, uh, given an input, um, uh, given, given the activations, it calculates a mean and a variance, which is calculated over the batch dimension and the spatial coordinates of the images. And then it normalizes the activations using this mean and the variance, and also adds the scale and shift parameters uh, to the model. And sort of one interesting thing to note here is that uh, because you're averaging over the uh, batch dimension, you can't just use it as it is during inference time. So what practitioners typically do is you store running averages of the mean and the variance during training and then you use that at inference time. So I just want to start off by saying, of course, batch norm has helped us make a lot of progress on a bunch of uh, popular benchmarks, particularly in vision. However, there's a number of limitations of batch normalization. Um, so first of all, it can be surprisingly expensive during training to calculate the gradients through the batch norm layers, and it, it, and it incurs additional kind of memory overhead. Um, as, I, as I sort of explained in the previous slide, it can introduce this uh, train test discrepancy in terms of how, it's, how it can be used. And this sort of requires maintaining these running statistics uh, during training, uh, which in turn introduces these hidden hyperparameters. And most, uh, most importantly, it sort of breaks the independence between the training examples and the loss. Um, and this causes a number of different problems. Um, first of all, um, it can be hard to replicate and this sort of like often causes a lot of bugs, hard to sort of debug, which are quite hard to debug, uh, especially when doing distributed training, when the data is sort of uh, distributed over different machines. Um, and because sort of like the training examples are now not independent with each other anymore, um, in the in the loss, uh, this makes it sort of like incompatible with certain tasks, like for example, sequence modeling or contrastive learning, where sort of like batch norm can allow the network to cheat in some in some ways. And because the statistics are calculated to the, over the batch dimension, um, you also get degradation in performance of batch normalization when you're using very small batch sizes, which in turn sort of limits the maximum model size you can use when you, uh, with batch norm uh, networks. So we sort of believe that all of these limitations together would harm the long-term kind of research progress in the community. And we would sort of like, like to come up with alternatives that do not have so many limitations. And so like for the rest of this talk, the philosophy I'm gonna take is that I'm, I'm just first gonna, we're first gonna identify the different batch norm benefits that it provides on residual networks. And then we're gonna look at what are simple ways to replicate these benefits in completely unnormalized uh, networks. And sort of like a point I would like to make here is that of course there's been a number of uh, alternate uh, normalization methods uh, which operate on the activation such as um, layer normalization, instant normalization, group normalization, and so on. Um, but in our experiments, we sort of found that they don't, didn't always generalize as well as batch norm networks. And all of these alternate activation normalizers have their own disadvantages, such as uh, they sort of introduce additional computation, uh, computational costs at uh, inference time. So here's sort of like, so for studying kind of what are the benef benefits that batch norm provides and on resonance, here's sort of the summary of that. Um, it provides like four main benefits. Um, batch norm biases resonance towards the skip path, which sort of fixes bad initialization in our networks. We show that batch norm enables efficient training with larger mini batches. Uh, it can act as an implicit regularizer, which improves performance on the test set and it can eliminate a mean shift that can arise on ReLU networks. 
And in our view, sort of like the single most important benefit of batch norm is the first one where it sort of fixes bad initialization by biasing resonance towards the skip path. And this benefit alone can sort of explain why we can train batch norm resonance with thousands of layers. So let's look at the force benefit and try to understand it a bit more. Um, and so this, this benefit sort of arises when we combine resonance with activation normalization layers. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily need to be batch norm. It, this benefit can arise with layer norm, group norm, et cetera. Um, but this sort of only arises when the normalization layer is placed on the residual branch here. So in this figure here, this is the residual path and the batch norm, the normalization layer is placed on the residual path. And this is where the benefit arises. And so to identify this benefit, we're gonna study the variance of the hidden activations at initialization for both an unnormalized and a normalized network. So let's first look at the unnormalized resonant. And so we are here, we're gonna look at what happens at initialization on an unnormalized resonant. So here on the residual path, you just have the nonlinearity and the conv layer without any batch norm layer. So if you, if the input to this restual block has variance of order one, um, the output of the restual path and the skip path would both have order variance one. And because the restual path and the skip path sums to sum is summed together, um, the, the, uh, the variance is order two at the end of the first restual block. And because it keeps summing up at the end of each restual blocks, this becomes order four at the next residual block and so on. So the variance of the output of the Lth uh, residual block would be order two to the L. And as you might expect, like this kind of exploding signal makes it extremely hard to actually train uh, these unnormalized resonance. For, so here we do a simple kind of depth experiment on a, uh, so this is a, C, a wide resonant on CIFAR 10 trained for 200 epochs. For, uh, for a fixed width and different depths. We see that we can train um, <clears throat> the depth 16 network, training completely, but training completely fails for the uh, depth 100 and the depth 1000 networks. So you might think that, you know, this, this exploding signal is very easily counteracted by, so you might say that what if we simply divide the output of the restual block by square root of two, and so this would ensure that the output of each residual block would have variance order one. But if we do the same depth experiment as before, we now see that while we can train a network of depth 100, um, training still fails for the depth 1000 network. And even for the depth 100 network, we see that performance really starts degrading quite a bit and the optimal learning rate also becomes lower. So why does this kind of fail? Uh, and the key sort of reason why this fails is that if you sort of look at any restual block here, you'll see that the restual and the skip branches contribute equally to the output. And so intuitively you can think of the output signal as sort of being composed of half of the restual branches and half of the skip paths. Um, and you can intuitively think that the effective depth of this resonant is roughly D over two, where D is the number of residual blocks in this network. And so like training this network is hard for the same reason the training of vanilla feed forward network is hard. It's because the signal becomes poorly conditioned the deeper the network gets. So now let's look at how a normalized resonant actually fixes this, this, uh, this issue. So here we consider the same resonant as before, but instead we now put in the batch normalization layers back in. Um, now, so let's look at how the signal propagates through this network. So if the input signal has a variance of order one, um, as before, the output of this residual branch, residual block would have signal of variance order two. Now for the next layer, because of this batch normalization layer, uh, this actually normalizes the output of this of the restual path to have variance one because of the normalization operation. So the output of this restual block would have order variance uh, or have would have variance of order three. 
And so we see that the variance of the Lth residual block would have uh, would be order L. And this kind of linear increase in the um, in the variance of the signal is actually what makes training easier on normalized uh, normalized resonant. So, so to sort of see this, if you consider like the Lth residual block here, the input to the Lth residual block would be a signal of scale L. And because um, of the batch normalization layer, the residual path would contribute a signal of variance one to the output. And so the residual branch in this case for the Lth residual block would contribute only a, a one over L plus one fraction of the variance of the output. So what this means is that for large L, for deep, deep blocks, uh, residual blocks, the output signal is dominated completely almost completely by the skip path. So almost all of the signal passes through the skip path. And this sort of means that like the effective depth of this resonant at initialization is much, much less than uh, D, which is uh, D being the number of residual blocks in the network. And if we do the same uh, depth experiment as before, we see that we can now sort of uh, train very, very deep networks. Uh, so depth up training still uh, is successful for depth thousand networks and you can train it to high test accuracies. Um, and in particular that the learning, the optimal learning dates is almost independent of the depth. And this is sort of like the key reason, uh, this downscaling of the residual uh, path is the key reason that normalized resonance can be trained for such deep uh, networks. All right, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. On, on that last slide, um, so the contribution of the, the batch norm path, the path of the batch norm decreases as you go along the layers. Does that mean yeah. that the later layers are almost useless? Do they contribute to anything? So at initialization, no, almost they don't contribute anything. But as sort of training progresses, um, they start contributing. So like you sort of start learning those layers as well. But at initialization, um, it's it basically doesn't contribute anything and this network is effectively shallow. Is that because the, the weight on the skip path decreases during training? The, uh, yeah, so like the, the well, the, the the uh, the weights would change on the comp layers, and so like the variance of the signal would not be uh, order one anymore. Um, and so like you increasingly start, so more of the signal increasingly passes through the residual path as training progresses. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right, so that might seem like a very uh, like simple kind of explanation for why you can train very deep batch norm resonance. So, sort of we then sort of were thinking about what kind of ablations we can run to sort of uh, recover to test this this property and what is the simplest way to recover this benefit. Um, so as as I just now uh, explained, uh, batch norm downscales the Lth residual branch by order square root of L. And if you sort of think about the depth of a typical residual block, it's order D, where D is the number of residual blocks in your network. And so you can say that on average, batch norm downscales the residual branch by uh, order square root of D. So sort of the simplest way to recover this benefit would be to sort of add this learnable scalar multiplier at the end of the, each residual branch. And sort of our theory predicts that so long as this alpha is initialized to a small enough value and specifically less than or equal to one over square root of D, uh, this deep uh, unnormalized resonant should be trainable. Uh, and th this sort of simple uh, change, we call the skip in it in the paper. And indeed, we see that this is the case. So like simply um, initializing alpha to a small enough value can make us, can help us train extremely deep networks without losing any performance. So here I'm showing results for two different uh, settings of alpha, uh, two different initializations of alpha. In the first case, we initialize it to one over square root of D. Um, and in the second case, 
this, we initialize it to alpha, uh, initialize alpha to zero. And so when you initialize it to zero at initialization, this restful block is simply the identity function. This, this path is completely blocked off. Uh, and in both cases, you see that you, you can train in uh, deep, very deep networks to high accuracies and the optimal learning dates are again, almost independent of the depth, just like the batch normalization case. And, and this sort of uh, confirms that like the, the main benefit of batch normalization um, for training very deep resonance comes from downscaling the rest tool path. All right, so that was sort of an explanation of the first benefit of uh, batch normalization. I'm now gonna briefly explain the other three benefits uh, that we see that sort of arises and affects uh, performance. Um, and in particular, we're now gonna look at uh, batch norms, large batch training benefits and its implicit regularization benefits. And to sort of understand these two benefits is gonna be very helpful to compare batch norm resonance with skip init resonance at a range of batch sizes. So we're gonna take like a standard benchmark such as the 16-4 wide resonant um, on CIFAR 10 in this case, and we're gonna train it for 200 epochs uh, at a range of batch sizes. And for each batch size, we're gonna tune the learning date to identify both the learning date which minimizes the training loss and the learning date which maximizes the test accuracy. And so here are the results for this, uh, for this experiment. So on the left plot here, we are plotting on the y-axis the optimal test accuracy versus on the x-axis different batch sizes. So for each batch size, we're independently tuning the uh, uh, tuning um, the model over a range of different learning dates and uh, showing results for the best, uh, for the best uh, attained uh, test accuracy. And on the right here, we're plotting the optimal training loss versus the, versus the batch size. And we're comparing batch norm, batch norm normalized resonance, uh, which is the plots in the blue here, versus skipping it in the green versus completely unnormalized resonance um, in orange here. So the first kind of takeaway from this plot is if you look at the right plot here, uh, we see that skipping it consistently reaches smaller training losses than batch norm, so long as the batch size is not too large. So for any batch size less than 1024, you see that skipping it gets to a smaller training loss than batch normalized resonance. But in spite of that, for those same batch sizes, if you now look at the left plot, which looks at the optimal test accuracy, we see that there's still quite a gap in the test accuracy uh, of skip init resonance versus batch normalized resonance. And this sort of indicates that batch norm has this additional implicit regularization effect that makes it uh, perform better on the test set um, uh, on, the, on, these, uh, on these models. And there's been some prior work which sort of suggests that this implicit regularization effect arises from the noise and the computation of the batch statistics. And so like this sort of, uh, because of this practitioners, what practitioners typically do is that they uh, use something called a ghost batch size, which determines the batch size over which the batch statistics of batch normalization are calculated over. And this sort of adds an extra hyperparameter uh, to think about when you're tr training batch normalized resonance, um, which of course adds the complexity of these models. Um, and so in these experiments, we keep the ghost batch size at 64. Um, and that is why sort of the batch norm, norm uh, uh, plots don't extend beyond the below batch size 64 in these plots. And in addition, if we sort of like now look at uh, how performance changes as the batch size grows, we see that performance, uh, you know, batch norm can hold up, hold its performance to at a constant level for a higher batch size compared to skipping. For it. so, skipping its performance starts dying, starts getting worse at batch sizes greater than, uh, uh, I guess, 128 in this case. Whereas batch normalization can hold its performance to a much higher uh, batch size, which means that it can sort of like efficiently use uh, larger batch sizes, which helps in speeding up training if, if we are uh, parallelizing across different machines. 
So why can batch norm scale to larger batch sizes? Um, to sort of understand this, it's going to be useful to actually look at the uh, what the optimal learning rates are corresponding to these uh, test accuracies. So here on the right, when I'm now plotting the optimal learning dates uh, versus the batch size. So here, each of the optimal learning dates sort of correspond to the performance on the, on the left axis, left, uh, left plot. Um, and so there's sort of two observations here. We see that for a small batch size, um, the learning date, the optimal learning date of skip init and batch and, and the batch normalized ResNet sort of increases linearly uh, with the batch size until it sort of like hits, uh, hits a threshold where sort of like the optimal learning date plateaus out. And so this is sort of like, you can intuitively, intuitively think of this threshold being sort of the maximum stable learning rate for this problem um, beyond which you can't you know, extend the learning rate further. So if we compare like the maximum stable learning rate for skip in networks and batch normalized resonance, we see that batch norm increases the maximum stable learning date uh, compared to skip in it. And this sort of suggests that the batch norm, uh, batch norm resonant loss landscape is better conditioned or smoother. And this has sort of been studied in some prior work. But one of the key sort of uh, points to make here is that this, this benefit of increasing the maximum stable learning rate is not actually relevant for small batch training. In, in, in small batch training, the optimal learning rate is sort of determined by the noise in the gradient estimates. And in this case, this, the optimal learning rate of skip in it and batch normalization are the same. And so this sort of, um, this property of increasing the maximum stable learning rate is only relevant when the batch size is large enough so that the curvature starts uh, starts playing a role in the uh, optimization dynamics. Okay, so those were benefits two and three. And um, finally, the, the fourth benefit is that batch norm can eliminate a mean shift in the activations that can arise in uh, ReLU networks. And so to understand this, it would be useful to first look at um, the activations of the network through a deep linear normalized resonance. So in this case, it's, uh, there's no non-linearity, simply a linear uh, batch normalized resonance. And we are plotting the variance on the skip path and the, rest, and the variance on the restoral branch and the moving variance of the batch norm statistics. And so we see that uh, as, the, you know, as the network depth increases, the, the uh, variance on the skip path increases linearly um, as sort of like the theory that I, as the analysis I just showed a few slides back. And because of the batch norm layer, uh, normalizing the activations on the restoral branch, the variance of the restoral branch is at one. And uh, consequently, like the batch norm moving variance also increases linearly so that, so it, so that it keeps the variance on the uh, restoral branch at one. And I'm not showing the batch norm moving mean squared uh, values here because they're basically zero in this case. And it's gonna be interesting to sort of compare this, uh, this plot with, the, uh, deep, with a deep ReLU normalized resonance. So in this case, we're simply adding in the nonlinearities, the ReLUs in the, in, the, in the resonance. And in this case, what we find is that, um, so, it's still the case that the variance on the, on the uh, restoral branch is one because of the batch normalized operation and the variance on the skip path increases linearly. But the difference arises if you now look at the batch norm statistics. So we see that in this case, both the, both the mean squared and the variance of the batch norm statistics increases linearly with the depth. So, so the question is, why does this happen? And, and the explanation is really simple. It's simply because the outputs of the ReLU activations have a positive mean. So the ReLU uh, nonlinearities that we use simply does a max over X and zero. And because the output has a positive mean of this, uh, output of this has a positive mean, uh, this, this causes the, the 
this mean shift in the signals. So to understand this a bit better, um, let's consider like this restoral block where you have a batch norm layer and followed by a ReLU and a conf. As I said, like the, the ReLUs have a positive mean. So this means that the input to the conf layer has a positive mean. And um, for almost any conf, conf layer at initialization, the outputs of, from this conf layer would also have a non-zero mean almost, almost surely. So for the next sort of residual block, the input to this residual block would have a, a, a non-zero mean. And for the signal passing through the residual branch, because of the batch norm, normalization um, operation, the batch norm would reset the mean to zero. And so this does not compound on the residual path. And this sort of like corrects for this mean shift and doesn't affect training. Uh, this mean shift still arises on the skip path and sort of compounds across uh, blocks, uh, as we saw in the previous slide. But this is sort of harmless because batch ground corrects for it on the restful path. And it's kind of interesting to note here is that if you sort of simply use a ReLU batch ground conf ordering, this would train equally stably while avoiding this mean shift on the skip path. Mike, can I ask you a quick question again? Yeah. Uh, so. Is, is mean shift when you end up going into the non-sensitive part of the activation function? Or what, what is mean shift? Uh, yeah, yeah. So like when sort of like, uh, because it's a max over x comma zero, uh, it's like uh, you're cutting out the negative part of the signal. Um, and that's why there's like a overall positive shift, uh, uh, shift towards the positive part. I uh, see, okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So to sort of understand this mean shift a bit better, um, let's look at how the signal passes, uh, looks like when it passes through uh, a single layer. So let's consider like random inputs X, which passes through an activation function G of X, followed by a linear layer W. And so if, if we sort of look at the mean of the outputs ZI, we see that this is equal to the fan in times the mean of the activations times the, times the mean of the row of, a, of the weight matrix. And so when, the, when both the mean of the activations and the mean of the weights are non-zero, this means that the mean of the outputs, output activations would also be non-zero. And the, of course, the mean of the activations, um, activation function is non-zero for you know, values and other kinds of uh, nonlinearities like values. Um, and, and also like the, the mean of the weight matrices, it would be non-zero with high probability. And this would be true even at initialization. This is because even when sort of sampled from, even when the weight is sampled from a zero mean distribution, any specific initialization, any specific sample from that distribution would have non-zero mean almost surely. Uh, and this is true even in the infinite width limit. So like you, you would still have this mean shift in practice when even at initialization. And of course, batch norm sort of corrects for this mean shift in the activations, but when you remove batch normalization and don't correct for this mean shift, training becomes much harder. Um, for on an unnormalized resume. So this is sort of like the, uh, I went through the four benefits of batch normalization. Um, and so now the question is, can we build normalizer free networks that recover each of these benefits and still uh, not lose performance? Um, I'm happy to take some questions at this point uh, before I move on to the next part. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, have you tried um, Have you tried integrating your technique in ResNet backbones in um, other networks? So um, let's say um, if if you if you do um, object detection with um, mask or CNN with a ResNet backbone, have you tried uh, using your method instead of the standard ResNet? And if so, does it improve results? 
Yeah, so we we do have some object detection results. Uh, I don't have them in this in this presentation, but like it does work well. I mean, uh, we we do um, we do get quite good results with that. We we we'll probably sort of update our people to sort of put in those results soon. Um, but yeah, I don't have them for this presentation. Um, and we also have sort of tried to put in simply our um, NF, NF, you know, normalize a free strategy on a bunch of different image classification backbones as well, like regnets and so on. And like, they work quite well. Um, but of course, like, uh, you know, we sort of also designed our own uh, family of models called NFNets, which I'm, I'll describe at the end of this talk, um, which sort of does better than uh, simply putting in then a strategy on a an existing backbone. All right, um, so I'll just move on. Um, so we described the, uh, you know, the four main benefits of batch normalization on ResNets. Um, and so now the question is whether we can sort of come up with simple replacements um, to get back the performance on unnormalized resonance. Um, so here's our basic normalized free strategy, which is sort of compatible uh, with most existing resonant architectures, which, which means that you can sort of like put it into any resonant backbones really. Um, so the way it works is uh, it sort of fixes initialization by downscaling the restful branch using these beta, beta scalers, um, which, uh, which basically work by analytically predicting the variance at initialization and simply downscaling, the, uh, downscaling by that predicted variance. And it also uses these alpha scalers, which control the rate at which the variance grows across uh, subsequent uh, residual blocks. And it eliminates the mean shift in the activations that can arise in ReLU networks um, using something called scale weight standardization, which I'm gonna describe in the next, uh, in the next uh, slide. And um, it's worth noting that we also get like competitive results on resonance using skip init plus scale weight standardization, but we found the NS strategy to be more stable at larger learning rates, which is why we went ahead with it. So what is uh, scale weight standardization? Um, it's a simple variation of weight standardization, which is which was proposed a couple of years back. Um, so what weight standardization does is it calculates the mean and the variance uh, across the rows of a weight matrix and normalizes the weight matrix using those uh, using the mean and the variance. Um, so you can see it like it explicitly sort of prevents mean shift by ensuring that the mean of each row of the weight matrix is exactly zero uh, at, in, at, at every step. So like it counteracts the, this mean shift in the activations that can arise. Um, and so scale weight standardization is simply a scaled version of this weight standardization method where we use uh, a non-linearity specific gain and a Fanon scaling, which is simply designed to preserve the variance of the signal passing through the through a restful uh, path. And note that scale weight standardization has none of the limitations of activation normalization methods. So like uh, it's extremely uh, extremely fast uh, during training and because it's simply a, like a reparameterization of the model, it can be folded into the way, you know, the mean and the variance can be folded into the weights um, during inference time. So it's completely free at inference time. So using this NF strategy, we sort of switched out, uh, you know, took out batch normalization from the standard ResNet models and put in this NF strategy uh, and compared our results. And we see that, you know, without any additional explicit regularization, NF ResNets achieve smaller training losses than batch norm ResNets but have slightly worse generalization performance. And that's, this is because they do not really share batch norms, like implicit regularization effect. But with kind of ex additional explicit regularization methods like dropout and stochastic depth, um, we find that NF resonance then 
now can match batch non-resonance on ImageNet across a range of different depths. So like in this case, uh, these are the regularized numbers which sort of compare very favorably with the batch norm, uh, batch norm uh, numbers. And more interestingly, we get substantially better performance when we pre-train <clears throat> Uh, on a large data set. So in, at Google, we have this uh, large internal data set called JFT, which is composed of 300 million images. And so the idea is you pre-train on JFT and then fine tune on ImageNet. And we see that doing this, we can get substantially better performance with NF resonance, uh, simply switching out batch norm with the NF, NF strategy. And uh, like our uh, hypothesis is that Batch, in this case, batch norms, implicit regularization actually hurts convergence on this massive data set. And like, because NF resonance do not have this implicit regularization effect, it can much better fit this very, very large data set. And, then, and so it performs much better when fine tuning on ImageNet. Um, so, okay, so we sort of recovered three of the benefits of batch normalization, but so uh, we still haven't recovered like uh, batch norms, large batch training benefits. So the previous results that I showed here was with batch size 1024, but NF resonance start performing much worse at larger batch sizes. So how do you sort of recover this large batch benefit? Um, well, there's been a lot of work in the community on sort of methods that work better for larger batches. Like for example, you know, Adam, uh, second order methods, momentum are all examples of, of methods that work better and start out performing as GD only in this sort of large batch regime. And normalized optimizers and gradient clipping are also examples of that. Uh, and so in this paper, we uh, explore gradient clipping algorithms. And it's yes, sort of so, based so, on- so, so, Soham, uh, yes, uh, hi. really quick question, hi. Um, is that due to the variance from the batch sizes? Uh, so, so basically like um, for larger batch sizes, uh, the variance presumably is like lower in your, is, is there some link there to the implicit regularization effect? Is that like the cause of why it's not um, generalizing as well? Uh, do you mean uh, these, these results? Um... Yeah, so for number two, you say batch, um, uh, so when you say you when you scale the batch size up here, it doesn't perform as well. And my question yeah. is, is that because of less implicit regularization? No, this is this is because of sort of like batch norm being able to scale up to larger learning dates, which are sort of like you know batch norm resonance are um, smoother last landscapes, and this sort of the smoother curvature starts making a difference only in this larger batch regime, but it doesn't really make a difference in the smaller batch regime up to batch size is 1024 because here the optimal learning rate is mostly determined by the noise and the gradient estimates, not by the curvature. Cool, makes sense, thank you. Okay, so to get back sort of like uh, batch norms, uh, large batch benefits, we, we uh, introduced this adaptive gradient clipping technique, which, which is sort of built on this intuition that Parameter updates should be small relative to the magnitude of the weights. Um, so if you sort of like this starts making a bit more sense, if you look, consider like the gradient descent update for layer L, which uses a gradient GFL with some step size H. Uh, notice that like a single gradient descent step would change the original weights by a, a a, a ratio determined by the uh, norm of the gradients by the norm of the weights. And so we simply use this above ratio to clip the gradient. So like if, the, if this ratio is greater than some threshold, you clip the gradients, otherwise you use the original gradients. And this is simply the adaptive gradient clipping algorithm. And using this uh, adaptive gradient clipping algorithm, we see that we can now train stably at larger uh, batch sizes. So here in this plot, we are comparing, uh, we are plotting top one accuracies on ImageNet versus the batch size uh, for a ResNet 50 and a ResNet 200. And we see that, you know, performance is constant for small batch sizes, but for larger batch sizes, this, the NF ResNet on its own sort of starts losing performance. Uh, 
Um, but when you add in the adaptive gradient flipping algorithm, it can maintain performance at this higher batch size uh, and can sort of like, uh, you know, um, uh, get back batch norms, large batch benefits. Um, another sort of pleasant surprise for us is, was that we, we found that we could also with, with AGC, we could suddenly train with very, very strong data augmentations, which really helped us scale to uh, state-of-the-art performances. Um, so we sort of now have all the pieces required to remove batch normalization from our networks. Um, so we sort of like then set out to design a new state-of-the-art model family. Um, and sort of unlike efficient nets, which were sort of designed to minimize theoretical flops, which we, which we actually found to not correspond to faster training speeds on the target ac accelerators that we have, that we actually use like GPUs or TPUs, we chose to sort of design networks that minimize actual training latency on, 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 our, on the machines that we train on, like uh, TPUs and GPUs. So I'm quickly gonna go through the rest of the talk because I'm slightly going over time. Um, so here's sort of like a one slide summary of what the NFNet architecture that we arrive at is. Um, and it's really quite simple. We start with a very simple baseline, which is uh, SE res next D, and then sort of manually tune for, you know, and add in best practices of model design, um, specifically designed to improve training uh, latency on TPUs and GPUs. So like we use a slightly different depth scaling pattern. We sort of scale up, scale up uh, uh, all the stages equally uh, for our larger models. And we gently scale the input resolution uh, for our larger models. Uh, we add in this extra three by three con, which we found to almost make no difference in training latency on our TPUs. Uh, and we use a slightly different, we use slightly wider models and don't actually scale uh, the width for our larger models. Um, so with this sort of simple kind of uh, design principles, um, we got our NFNet fa model family. And we found that the NFNet model family are first of all, extremely expressive. Um, and if you, if you sort of don't uh, use, don't use uh, explicit regularization, they can sometimes overfit. Um, and this is, we think it's because first of all, it's very expressive and it doesn't have the implicit regularization effects of batch normalization. Um, and so we sort of try, tried adding in a lot of very, you know, a lot of different data augmentation methods and we found performance to improve quite a bit using these data augmentation methods. And here's sort of like an ablation that shows consistent improvement when using, when adding in different data augmentation methods to our models. And sort of like doing all of this, we, uh, this is sort of the final result that I've, showed right at the beginning of the talk as well, where we, where we find significant speed ups over previous, uh, previous models. Like um, we get a significantly higher state of the art, uh, new state of the art of 86.5 um, top one accuracy without extra data. And it's all of, you know, we get state of the art across a range of training based latencies. It's significantly faster than some of the prior work uh, that were uh, there. And uh, in, in the paper, we have a much more detailed kind of uh, table, which uh, compares all the different models across flops, parameters, and training speed. Um, and also we've tried, again, sort of transferring from JFT with these larger models. Um, and we see that we sort of, we attain like a second best performance that's in sort of the leaderboard. We get an 89.2% per top one accuracy on ImageNet. Um, this is slightly lower than the 90.2 that the meta pseudo labels paper gets, but it does use like 12 times less compute um, than that paper. Um, so just to quickly summarize, um, we sort of, to remove batch normalization, we first try to understand the benefits of batch normalization and try to come up with simple alternatives 
Um, we found that Bashnam downscales the residual branch, which we sort of uh, got back by our NF strategy. Bashnam enables large batch training, uh, which we uh, recover using adaptive gradient clipping. Um, we, we get back Bashnam's implicit regularization effect using explicit regularization. And we use scale weight standardization to prevent the mean shift uh, in the activations that arise on ReLU networks. Uh, I just want to quickly mention that this is, I'm, we're not claiming that these are the best ways to sort of recover each of these benefits, but this is a way that worked well for us. Um, and so the resulting normalized free resonance, uh, we found to substantially outperform batch norm resonance after large scale pre-training and our NFNet model family sets new image and state of the art. Um, of 86.5 while being substantially faster to train. And uh, if you're currently using a ResNet backbone, um, these are really a drop-in replacement and are substantially more expressive. Um, we have Jack's code available that are free to use. Um, and thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs>